My First Summer in the Sierra by John Muir June 13 Another glorious Sierra day in which one seems to be dissolved and absorbed and sent pulsing onward, we know not where. Life seems neither long nor short, and we take no more heed to save time or make haste than do the trees and stars. This is true freedom, a good practical sort of immortality. Yonder rises another white skyland. How sharply the yellow pine spires and the palm-like crowns of the sugar pines are outlined on its smooth white domes and hawk. The grand thunder billows booming, rolling from ridge to ridge, followed by the faithful shower. A good many herbaceous plants come thus far up the mountains from the plains and are now in flower two months later than their lowland relatives. Saw a few columbines today. Most of the ferns are there in prime. Rock ferns on the sunny hillsides. Chalantus, Pelia, Dinogram, Woodwardia, Aspidium, Woodsia along the stream banks, and the common terrace on sandy flats. This last, however common, is here making shows of strong, exuberant, abounding beauty to set the botanist wild with admiration. I measured some scarce full grown that are more than seven feet high, though the commonest and most widely distributed of all the ferns, I might almost say that I never saw it before. The broad shouldered fronds held high on smooth stout stalks growing close together, overleaning and overlapping, make a complete ceiling beneath which one may walk erect over several acres without being seen as if beneath a roof, and how soft and lovely the light streaming through this living ceiling, revealing the arcing branching ribs and veins of the fronds as the framework of countless panes of pale green and yellow plant glass nicely fitted together, a fairyland created out of the commonest fern stuff. The smaller animals wander about as if in a tropical forest. I saw the entire flock of sheep vanish at one side of a patch and reappear a hundred yards farther on at the other, their progress betrayed only by the jerking and trembling of the fronds, and strange to say, very few of the stout woody stalks were broken. I sat a long time beneath the tallest fronds, and never enjoyed anything in the way of a bower of wild leaves more strangely impressed. Only spread a fern frond over a man's head, and worldly cares are cast out, and freedom and beauty and peace come in. The waving of a pine tree on the top of a mountain a magic wand in nature's hand. Every devout mountaineer knows its power, but the marvelous beauty value of what the Scotch call a bracken in a still dell. What poet has sung this? It would seem impossible that anyone, however encrusted with care, could escape the godful influence of these sacred fern forests. Yet, this very day, I saw a shepherd pass through one of the finest of them without betraying more feeling than his sheep. What do you think of these grand ferns, I ask? Oh, they're only big breaks, he replied. Lizards of every temper, style, and color dwell here, seemingly as happy and companionable as the birds and squirrels. Lowly, gentle fellow mortals 
enjoying God's sunshine, and doing the best they can in getting a living. I like to watch them at their work and play. They bear acquaintance well, and one likes them the better the longer one looks into their beautiful, innocent eyes. They are easily tamed, and one soon learns to love them, as they dart about on the hot rocks, swift as dragonflies. The eye can hardly follow them, but they never make long, sustained runs. Usually, only about ten or twelve feet, then a sudden stop, and as sudden a start again, going all their journeys by quick, jerking impulses. These many stops I find are necessary as rests, for they are short-winded, and when pursued steadily, are soon out of breath, pant pitifully, and are easily caught. Their bodies are more than half tail, but these tails are well managed, never heavily dragged, nor curved up as if hard to carry. On the contrary, they seem to follow the body lightly of their own will. Some are coloured like the sky, bright as blue birds. Others grey like the lichen rocks on which they hunt and bask. Even the horned toad of the plains is a mild, harmless creature, and so are the snake-like species, which glide in curves with true snake motion, while their small, undeveloped limbs drag as useless appendages. One specimen, fourteen inches long, which I observed closely, made no use what whatever of its tender, sprouting limbs, but glided with all the soft, sly ease and grace of a snake. Here comes a little, grey, dusty fellow, who seems to know and trust me, running about my feet and looking up cunningly into my face. Carlo is watching, makes a quick pounce on him, for the fun of the thing, I suppose. But Liz has shot away from his paws like an arrow, and is safe in the recesses of a clump of chaparral. Gentle saurians, dragons, descendants of an ancient and mighty race. Heaven bless you all, and make your virtues known, for few of us know as yet that scales may cover fellow creatures as gentle and lovable as feathers, as or hair or cloth. Mastodons and elephants used to live here no great geological time ago, as shown by their bones, often discovered by miners in washing gold gravel, and bears of at least two species are here now, besides the California lion or panther, and wild cats, wolves, foxes, snakes, scorpions, wasps, and tarantulas. But one is almost tempted at times to regard a small savage black ant as the master existence of this vast mountain world. These fearless, restless, wandering imps though only about a quarter of an inch long, are fonder of fighting and biting than any beast I know. They attack every living thing around their homes, often without causes, as far as I can see. Their bodies are mostly jaws curved like ice hooks, and to get work for these weapons seems to be their chief aim and pleasure. Most of their colonies are established in living oaks, somewhat decayed or hollowed, in which they can conveniently build their cells. These are chosen probably because of their strength, as opposed to the attacks of animals and storms. They work both day and night, creep into dark caves, climb the highest trees, wander and hunt through cool ravines as well as on hot unshaded ridges, and extend their highways and byways over everything but 
water and sky. From the foothills to a mile above the level of the sea, nothing can stir without their knowledge, and alarms are spread in an incredibly short time, without any howl or cry that we can hear. I can understand the need of their ferocious courage. There seems to be no common sense in it. Sometimes, no doubt, they fight in defense of, of their homes, but they fight anywhere and always, wherever they can find anything to bite. As soon as a vulnerable spot is discovered on man or beast, they stand on their heads and sink their jaws. And though torn limb from limb, they will yet hold on and die biting deeper. When I contemplate this fierce creature, so widely distributed and strongly entrenched, I see that much remains to be done ere the world is brought under the rule of universal peace and love. On my way to camp a few minutes ago, I passed a dead pine nearly 10 feet in diameter. It has been enveloped in fire from top to bottom, so that now it looks like a grand black pillar set up as a monument. In this noble shaft, a colony of large jet black ants have established themselves laboriously cutting tunnels and cells through the wood, whether sound or decayed. The entire trunk seems to have been honeycombed, judging by the size of the talus of gnawed chips, like sawdust piled up around its base. They are more intelligent looking than they are small, belligerent, strong-scented brethren, and have better manners, though quick to fight when required. Their towns are carved in fallen trunks as well as in those left standing, but never in sound living trees or in the ground. When you happen to sit down to rest or take notes near a colony, some wandering hunter is sure to find you and come cautiously forward to discover the nature of the intruder and what ought to be done. If you are not too near the town or keep perfectly still, he may run across your feet a few times, over your legs and hands and face, up your trousers, as if taking your measure and getting comprehensive views. Then go in peace without raising an alarm. If, however, a tempting spot is offered or some suspicious movement excites him, a bite follows, and such a bite. I fancy that a bear or wolf bite is not to be compared with it. A quick electric flame of pain flashes along the outraged nerves, and you discover for the first time how great is the capacity for sensation you are possessed of. A shriek, a grab for the animal, and a bewildered stare follow this bite of bites as one comes back to consciousness from sudden eclipse. Fortunately, if careful, one need not be bitten often than once or twice in a lifetime. This wonderful electric species is about three-fourths of an inch long. Bears are fond of them and tear and gnaw their home logs to pieces and roughly devour the eggs, larva, parent ants and the rotten or sound wood of the cells, or in one spicy acid hash. There is also a fine, active, intelligent-looking red species, intermediate in size between the above. They dwell in the ground and build large piles of seed husks, leaves, straws, etc. over their nests. Their food seems to be mostly insects and plant leaves, seeds, and sap. How many mouths nature has to fill? How many neighbors we have? How little we know about them? And how seldom we get in each other's way? Then, to think of the infinite numbers of smaller fellow mortals, invisibly small, 
compared with which the smallest ants are as mastodons. <laughs>